juvenile students caught in the cycle of incarceration face numerous challenges. Limited access to education, disrupted learning, and lack of resources hinder their development. Social stigmas and stereotypes contribute to their marginalization and limited opportunities, not to mention mental health issues affecting their overall well-being, uh, really kind of mess up with their lives. Breaking this cycle requires a holistic approach. Hi there, I'm Tej, here with another story that highlights the work of nonprofits and more importantly, shines a light on the incredible people who dare to work for them. Joel Van Kuyken's professional background is in communications, public relations, digital media, and design thinking. And he is passionate about helping channel ideas into reality. In 2020, he left his corporate job to dedicate his time to drive the vision of the Delta Project, ensuring its sustainability into the future. And in addition to serving as co-executive director, Joel is a facilitator of the Delta Project Conversations. We'll know about that in a moment. And he leads the Future Skills Digital Editing Program for the Delta Project. Welcome to the podcast, Joel. Thank you, Tej. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Uh, this is something that is very unique. You are working with juvenile kids and you're sp- you're specifically focusing on telling their stories. Yeah, um, it really is about narrative change and how we kind of, our perceptions of people who are dealing with the juvenile justice system, the carceral system here in the States, and cross-system involvement as well. Um, So, you know, our goal in the Delta Project is really to kind of help these children and their families ultimately become something they might not have seen, something they haven't been exposed to, to become something they don't see, which is kind of our North Star for the organization. True, very true. Uh, Now, I'm sure you have come across very touching stories, uh, sometimes very disturbing stories as well. Do you think that these kids have been misrepresented? Do you think they have not been Uh, respected enough uh, in the society, and hence these actions have taken place? I think that's part of it. I think it's a a complicated uh, equation. I think a lot of of these these young men uh, and and young kids are dealing with generational trauma, and they're dealing with things that put them in positions where they have tough choices to make. And sometimes the choices they make lead them in the wrong direction. But there's something about the terminology of at risk that we just like to kind of turn on its head. If you really think about it, these kids aren't at risk, they're at potential. And if we start Mm -hmm. to change our view and understand that, you know, maybe they struggle a bit in school, they do things differently, uh, maybe they are disruptors. They disrupt because they may not be getting the kind of nurturing and support that they need for a variety of reasons, but aren't ultimately those the people, aren't those the people that end up breaking the mold and becoming the innovators and leaders Mm -hmm. in societies? So the fact that we penalize young people for mistakes that they've made and kind of put them into the system that holds on to them for a long time mm-hmm. means that potential for our society is being limited because we've limited the opportunity for these kids to become what they're meant to become, which is not an incarcerated father. True. So, yeah, that's kind of where we're coming from, really understanding how we can support our guys and gals when they return to the community, if they're on probation, um, if they're in our county jail in the juvenile pod, you know, how do we listen and really understand what the needs are? Not show up with, hey, we've got this program that we think is great and we want you to take part in it. And they're like, oh, I'm not interested. 
But really, you know, from a design thinking perspective, how do we really listen and understand and observe what these young people are dealing with so that we can then design programs that actually serve them and help create systems change? Right. I was uh, going to come to this question any which way. Uh, uh, what was the first reaction that you got when you entered this uh, these premises? And the first person that you connected with and said that, you know, this is how I would like to help you. So I, I are you talking about my connection with Cole Williams and, you know, my co-founder? Um, um, uh, well, that too. Uh, but the first person that you had in your program, what was his or her reaction to what you wanted to do for them? Well, I mean, it's really empowering for them. Um, it, it helps them see maybe things a little differently. And I think I just want to tell you a bit about our origin story because it, sure. it really articulates kind of what you're asking a little bit better. So Cole Williams, you know, co-founder in the Delta Project, um, he and I served on a nonprofit board together around 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. um, and got to know each other then. Uh, but Cole uh, grew up in a place called Benton Harbor, Michigan. Um, he was raised, he, he had a son at 16 um, and ended up raising that son. And then he ultimately uh, got involved in the foster care system okay. and fostered seven more sons, adopted okay. uh, a couple of them. Well, yes. one of his sons ended up in the, juvenile justice system. Mm -hmm. And he started to see, you know, with his background in social work, he just started to see how traumatic entering into that system was. And he ended up reaching a point where he started teaching in our uh, juvenile detention center every Friday. Mm -hmm. So one Friday back in 2017, he was telling all the young men about all the people of color in the community that he sees doing amazing things. And one of the guys raised his hand, or maybe a little sheepishly in the back of the room, and basically said, well, that's great, Mr. Cole, that you see that, but I don't see that in my neighborhood, and how am I supposed to become something I don't see? And that profound question, Cole didn't know how to answer it. Mm -hmm. And I was privileged enough that he came to me with that question in okay. late summer 2017 at a local coffee shop uh, called Early Bird. You know, it's a great little coffee shop here in our community. <laughs> um, and we talked about this and he wanted to make a tabletop book. He said, mm -hmm. we can make a book and we can feature all of these different men in the community and tell their stories. And I just, I had just come out of uh, design thinking program and was really keen listening to things that were happening in the community. Mm -hmm. And I knew this was much bigger. This was a movement. And I told yes, Cole, it is. look, but there's much more to this. At the time in my corporate job, I, you know, I was working as a copywriter and, and PR communicator, marketing person. Um, and I had a partner in my work who runs a production studio called Gorilla Productions. His name is Eric Johnson. Okay. I invited him into the conversation to meet with Cole and I. And what we decided to do in 2019, we started going into the juvenile detention center mm -hmm. on a Friday afternoon. We brought in all of this, everything you can imagine a professional video shoot would have. You know, we had two red cameras, but we had it set up in a box with mirrors in the box so that we could sit people down across from each other mm -hmm. and they could carry on a conversation and it would be a split screen video. It very much looks like a Zoom video, but this was before Zoom was really a thing. Okay. And what we did, we started teaching the guys in the detention center, teach them audio, teach them lighting, teach them behind the scenes, teach them all the different positions in a production but then we would have one young man interview someone who would come in from the community that they hadn't seen. Mm -hmm. So that idea of how do I become something I don't see, what we did is we manifested that in the, in the juvenile detention center. And we created these opportunities for 
mentorship to happen right before your eyes. So we would they would we would sit down and have a conversation between, you know, the person coming in and the student in detention, and they would talk for forty five minutes or an hour, and we would capture that. And we did that. We did mm-hmm. five episodes in two thousand nineteen. Um, we incorporated in September of 2019, we got our 501c3 in March of 2020. And right after we became an official 501c3 nonprofit, COVID kind of lockdown came and everything shifted. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It forced us to kind of rethink our approach. You know, we couldn't go into the detention center anymore. It just wasn't possible. Um, So we began to become much more engaged with probation officers and tried to work more more intentionally with guys really leaving detention and coming back into the community, Mm -hmm. helping them engage with the community um, and helping the community see them and listen to these teenage guys who had their own things that they were working through. I'm mean, asking questions that maybe weren't being asked of them and giving them an opportunity to see a way forward that, you know, the only kind of suit they might see would be a prison jumpsuit. Well, if that's all you're seeing, you're probably, there's a good chance you might become that. Mm-hmm. So it's really a question of how do we, how do we, again, see these guys as that potential and give them the space to work through these challenges they're dealing with, guide them well enough that they can become those leaders in our community. That's really the genesis of how this all started. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. And uh, do you think that uh, the glamour of having a camera and the red box, the red camera and, you know, all those... uh, you know that that those things that go into your production. Do you think that attracted them, or uh, did, do you think that gave you a kind of a entry into their lives? I think that was part of it. You know, they saw that we were serious. I mean, I think when we first went into the juvenile detention center and did this, they weren't expecting much. The staff there, that we just maybe come in with a handheld camera and and uh-huh. do some interviews. We showed up with, you know, a van full of equipment and it, the we had all sorts of carrying all this stuff in like a professional video shoot mm-hmm. and people were just kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? But they saw the potential in it. Yeah. So I think that played into how the students felt about it. But also, you know, the guys are really into music, music videos, things like that. You know, we started teaching digital editing as well. Mm-hmm. and giving guys an opportunity to start editing, learning how to edit together their own stories. We use Adobe Premiere Pro, which is kind of a editing standard uh, software in the industry. So if they know how to edit in Adobe Premiere, you know, that could take them somewhere if they really take to it. So that's part of our future awesome. skills training that we do as well. Awesome. And uh, where did you get the funding? Was this all self-funded initially? And do you still do that? Initially, it was. You know, we, um, as you mentioned, you know, I left my corporate job in January of 2020. Yeah. What I did for a while, I was an adjunct professor for a couple of years to just to kind of bridge the gap. Mm-hmm. And I just began to understand that building a vision and a mission in an organization like this you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And if it did, it probably wouldn't last. And I had to get my head around the fact that, you know, this was going to take a little longer and we had to be committed. And I felt like I got some really good advice from someone, very simple advice. She, she said, just do a little bit each day. Sounds very simple, but it's very powerful because if you can do just a little bit of that work each day before you know it, that's going to be a lot of work. It adds up. So initially, we got a $10,000 grant, our first grant, which was to help fund a consultant to help us build some capacity. Mm-hmm. And that was really key. That person helped us better articulate our mission and vision. She helped us 
build out our programming in such a way that we could measure outcomes properly and really deliver on our programming. Um, and that led to a number of grants. We got a $30,000 grant from a local foundation that That's helped nice. us kind of operationalize our board of directors a bit and work on some other work. We were funded by our local United Way uh, for about 160 over three years to do this initiative with two other nonprofits called We Matter Now. So we have this cohort of young men in the We Matter Now uh, program. And these guys are high school uh, boys of color mm -hmm. um, who join this annual uh, event, but then we, we do training with them. We're gonna do our future skills training with them this summer. And then we've, we've gotten money from another local foundation, which was operational budget. And then we recently received a grant from the Public Welfare Foundation out of DC to really expand our storytelling even further and Wonderful. tell the stories of people dealing with the juvenile justice system and the carceral system here in the United States and specifically here in Michigan and West Mich Michigan where I'm located. Let's take a break to understand what Jazuba is. Everyone at some point ponders on how this beautiful life can be made more meaningful. Maybe you're a leader trying to enhance your employee's experience at your organization. Or you already work for the community and seek volunteers with state-of-the-art skills to strengthen your nonprofit. Whatever your situation, know that you can make a difference. Chizuba began with this very vision, a vision to facilitate every skill and every passion in the world in meeting a social need. Corporate volunteering has several benefits for both businesses and organizations. In parallel, experienced and enthusiastic volunteers join NGO workers, enabling them to serve the community more effectively. Chizuba offers everyone looking to add purpose and meaning to their lives a chance to connect or volunteer virtually with nonprofit organizations from over 100 countries around the world. Visit www.chizuba.net and explore opportunities to find meaning. Chizuba, your platform to do good. And now, back with our guest. Okay. Uh, Joel, tell us about the programs that you are running. I uh, read on your website you have something called as a Boys to Mentors. Uh, so and boys, you have, yeah. Sorry, yes. Please, please tell us. Yeah, Boys to Mentors is kind of the the title of what the Delta Project does in terms of mentorship. Mm -hmm. So, working in our um, county jail in the juvenile pod, a lot of the guys there are are waiting to go to prison. Uh, so, uh, Cole Williams, co-founder goes into the juvenile pod every Friday afternoon mm -hmm. and works with these guys. We try to help them understand their stories better and try to help them maybe come to terms with what their future might hold. Yeah, some are going to prison, some will return home. Um, really helping them get in touch with, you know, what their choices entail and how to better navigate the systems that they're going to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. But that kind of idea of mentorship is really baked into everything that we do. Uh, but then some of our other programs, um, for instance, the Young Fathers Initiative, mm -hmm. it's really an important program. You know, Cole Williams' background is in fatherhood since, you know, he basically raised eight sons, really understands what it means to have superhero fathers mm -hmm. and recognizing the importance of fathers in our community is a big part of his kind of why and why he does what he does. But ultimately what was happening, a lot of these guys would come into the juvenile detention center. No one was asking them if they were about their families, if they were fathers. Mm -hmm. Many of these guys under 18 are already fathers. So we started something called Wi-Fi, the Young Fathers Initiative. And it's working with men on probation or in the, the juvenile justice system 
who are having to learn how to raise their children. Maybe they're on probation and they're, they might be on a tether. They might be trying to go to school. They might be trying to raise money to take care of their kids. They're trying to be present in their child's lives in such a way that it might help us break this, this cycle that we're seeing. Um, because, you know, often, and there's nothing wrong with it, but we, when we think about kids, we think about their mothers as we should. But the fathers play an important role too. Absolutely. And the father shouldn't just be seen as, oh, he's going to bring toys and money and show up periodically. Uh, instead, that father needs to nurture their children and be truly engaged in their children's lives. So that's kind of the foundation of that. And Cole has a whole curriculum he developed. It's an evidence-based curriculum called Son to a Father. So when he runs through that program with these guys, he's bringing them through that curriculum. And we're reaching a point where some of the guys that are kind of graduating out of that curriculum, mm -hmm. we want to train them as trainers so okay. that they can begin teaching other fathers about young fathers about fatherhood. Because I think being in that cohort, being younger um, and being able to connect is, is a big part of the work that we do. You know, I'm older. Cole's a little bit older. We can relate, but we can't totally relate. You know, <laughs> generations. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, when you uh, uh, typically how long is this uh, duration for this course, this Young Fathers Initiative? Well, the Young Fathers Initiative is just ongoing, and we do it at a local alternative school. Mm -hmm. um, Cole meets with the guys every Wednesday. You know, our summer break is coming up, so we have to move to a different location to keep in touch mm -hmm. with the guys. Mm -hmm. You know, but they have basic needs. You know, they need diapers. They need mm -hmm. formula. They need cribs and different things. So we're setting up a pantry of sorts at their school that has been funded. It's gonna provide, it's gonna be stocked with diapers and baby food, things that they'll need so that the guys have access to it. Uh, Cause they're in high school. They've also got to take care of their kids. You know, let's give them some of the supplies they're gonna to need to really show up as fathers. So the curriculum itself, I mean, I'm not sure how long it actually takes. I mean. Cole would know those details better than me, but I know that there is a, a there's a community of young fathers here in West Michigan that need support. We need to to see them and hear them and help them make it through this stage of their lives. Right, and this problem is uh, prevalent uh, so much that do you think it should be you know treated earlier rather than uh, speak about it and help? Of course, your help is important, but do you think this, that this problem should be addressed uh, much earlier in maybe schools? I think in general, uh, as a society here in the States, we need to address everything earlier. So yes, of course, uh, but you know, I think simultaneously we need to be able to work on the problem as it exists and also look for ways to get upstream and really take a deeper systems approach to the issue. And that can happen through a number of interventions, I believe. Um, but many, I think, many things. yeah, what I'm under, this, this isn't easy. You know, this, this takes time. And I think we're so conditioned in societies where it's based on scarcity and how much we get of something versus how much we don't get of something that we want things to happen quickly, but it's not going to happen overnight. Again, it's a little Absolutely. bit each day. How can we chip away at this and really start to make a difference in people's lives? True. True. Um, coming to the stories that you're narrating about these uh, juveniles, uh, what are the platforms that you use to amplify these stories? So, you know, we have a YouTube channel, we've got a Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and we've got the media room on our website. And we're trying to revamp that media room. We also are going to be establishing our own podcast here soon. Uh, 
some of that funding is going to help us build kind of a, a new office space with a podcast studio built into it Lovely. so that we can really begin to tell the stories of of our guys and of returning citizens who really have stories to share about what they've been through and what they've overcome and how they've become something they don't see. So I think it goes back to that, that North Star question. The podcast will really help us uh, better articulate the stories of, of our guys. You know, there's a beautiful African proverb. I don't know if you've heard it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes like this. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. And I think that really stuck with me when I heard that, because that is kind of ancient, probably ancient insight that really speaks to how we need to think about the present and the future. We don't create space for these people to become Very the true. potential that they have. Um, we're all going to burn down. You know, we have to be in a position to support future leaders in our community. It's going to be hard. You're going to have challenges. Guys are going to make poor choices. But we have to keep the faith and keep working at it and keep trying. It's so nice to hear these positive words from you, Joel. And I'm going to go back uh, with uh, these golden nuggets that you have shared three things till now one is about visualizing your potential where you are how can i be what i cannot see and uh, take each day as it comes do a little every day and this is the one that also is beautiful uh, quote that you have mentioned here mm. uh, joel uh, now of course you are telling stories you are ensuring that people are hearing these stories but sometimes do you think that it is possible to maybe perpetuate uh, stereotypes or stigmas uh, that are associated with incarceration? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big issue. There are a lot of stereotypes of, of black boys and black men. Um, I heard someone speak a little while ago, it was actually at the We Matter Now conference. Um, instead of talking about stereotypes, we should be thinking in terms of prototypes, he said. <laughs> and that we shouldn't be stereotyping people. We should be thinking, how can we prototype? How can we help them um, see them without bias and without heuristics that narrow us toward a certain belief that may not be deep enough for us to truly understand what's going on? Brings me back to kind of that design thinking approach that of listening and observing. Uh, there are a lot of stereotypes out there we're all subject to them. We're all subject to biases. I would just encourage everyone to think about mental models and think in ways that allow you to go deeper. Why do you do what you do? Why do you think this way? What is causing me to believe something that I believe? And really try to deconstruct it and think differently about it. Um, I think that's part of the challenge also. And that's kind of the message that we're working to convey uh, to our communities mm -hmm. and to really understand, you know, these big, wicked problems, we may not solve them, but the mm -hmm. more that we try and the more that we get kind of lost in that fuzzy front end, as they call it, um, mm -hmm. chances are that some solutions will start to reveal themselves. We can't jump to outcomes too quickly because we'll jump in the wrong spot. So we really have to be conscious and really think through why we're doing what we're doing and really listen. You know, there's a, another great quote. I don't know. You know, I'm a big fan of Krishnamurti. And he said, uh, the ability to observe without evaluating is the highest form of intelligence. And that's a really interesting quote that struck me when I first heard it. And it took me a while to figure it out. But it made me realize that, you know, these biases, these stereotypes are the result of us jumping too quickly to a conclusion. And not that's really human nature, wouldn't you say? That's human exactly. nature. When you meet somebody for the first time, you uh, exactly. tend to make a judgment based on maybe appearance, maybe the language, maybe the, you know, dialect. 
Mm -hmm. It is human nature and it takes some time for people to change that perspective a little bit. It takes practice. Absolutely. <laughs> that That's part of the what I'm kind of imploring people to think through is let's go against human nature a little bit mm -hmm. and think a little more deeply about why am I feeling this way? What has caused me to think the way I'm thinking? Can I think differently? Should I think differently? You know, and how best do I, you know, achieve this sort of approach where I'm going to be able to, to actualize a bit better and to be a better person and a better right. citizen? Right. I think it takes a calm mind. I think it takes something. Uh, it takes a longer time for you to come to some kind of an evaluation. Like, even if you say you don't want to evaluate, but you still need some time to Absolutely. think through the entire process. That's wonderful. Lastly, Joel, I would like to ask you, what are the long-term goals that you have for the organization, the Delta Project? You already have a lot going, but yeah, do you uh, yeah. envision something ahead? Yeah, so we have a really nice partnership with a local alternative school called Next Tech High School here in mm -hmm. Grand Rapids, Michigan. They work with many kids who have, are dealing with or have dealt with the juvenile justice system. And we are doing our future skills programming there uh, for their students, which then overlaps with you know, our customers, which are got families dealing with juvenile justice. The goal is to continue to expand our future skills programming. We're actually working with an organization called Casual OS. They teach virtual reality coding to create simulations. Um, wow. What we yeah. want to be able to do, we're trying to raise the funding to start teaching this coursework at Next Tech High School and elsewhere so that we can train high school students or anyone who would like to learn this how to code in the simulation space. This is a future skill that's very much needed around the world. You know, as we Absolutely. build out the future uh, tech space, simulations that allow people to experience something uh, in a training setup and to bring better enlightenment. What I really want to do, I want to stay in this tech space, but I want the Delta Project to be focused on the humanities, mm -hmm. to bring the stories into the tech. It's like I think we're so blend. Yeah, tech is the container. But if you don't have the stories, the ethics, the humanities, you have nothing to really fill the container. So I hope the Delta Project long term continues to do what we're doing, but even expands our impact and reaches more young people, more families, and helps individual people find a way to navigate these systems so that they're not at the mercy of our society in the wrong way, that they can become what they're meant to become. That's so beautiful. That's a beautiful thought. I did mention last question, but as you spoke, uh, you know, this uh, question arises in my mind. When you say you want to train these kids in tech, don't, uh, don't they need to have some kind of a basic background to understand and go ahead? Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's part of that. You know, I think that starts with some basic skills of storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. We know how to tell our stories and we can start with knowing how to think. Chances are we're going to be able to write better. We're going to be able to understand things better. Then when we engage with coding or tech or these different tools, we're going to have better context to know how to use them so that the tech doesn't end up using us, but we're in charge of the tech. And I think with generative AI, all the things happening in the tech space right now, there's a big struggle between, you know, is, are we being overtaken by technology or mm -hmm. are we still in a position to help regulate and mediate how tech impacts our lives? So it's a bigger question. Again, a little bit each day, hopefully we'll get us there. Yes. <laughs> Well, Joel, I'm going back from this podcast with a lot of knowledge, with a lot of inspiration. You know, I can see how the Delta Project is going ahead and 
growing bigger because of the way you are thinking, because of the way uh, Cole Williams is thinking. And I wish you luck. I'm very happy to have connected with you. I'm very glad to know that there are people in the world who are thinking of the not so privileged in terms of opportunities and telling their stories and changing narratives. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's a pleasure to get to know you on this podcast and I hope we can keep in touch and support each other's work. Absolutely. Uh, Chezuba also has uh, volunteers online where you can connect with and take the help with uh, your social media or anything to do with digital content because this is all virtual. So you can okay. definitely uh, connect with us there. Excellent. All right. Great. Wonderful talking to you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you.